Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of Catching Up to Fi. I'm Bill Yount, and I need to let you know that this week's edition is recorded live in front of a Camp Fi Midwest audience. Becky was co-host of a panel discussion on all things Fi. I think you'll find it humorous, insightful, and of great value. We hope you enjoy this On the Road with Catching Up to Fi episode. Remember, as a call to action, we can certainly use your help in supporting the maintenance cost of Catching Up to Fi. We have on our website a link, Support Us, that allows you to buy us a coffee uh, for a low cost in order to help us with uh, defraying the maintenance costs. If you could do this, we'd be eternally grateful. Thanks a lot and enjoy this week's episode of Catching Up to Fi. Hi, and welcome to Catching Up to Fi, a podcast on mindset, money, life, on the journey to financial independence. I'm Bill, and I'm a late starter. I'm Becky, and I'm also a late starter, and we're your hosts. We're here to help you with your journey to financial independence, no matter where you're starting from. We're going to talk to other late starters, experts, and we'll explore topics related to our mission. Join us as we catch up to Fi together. We are live here at Camp Fi Midwest 2023. Make some noise. (laughs) Holy schmoly, that was louder than I thought it was going to (laughs) be. So this is a tri-cast, I guess I'd call it. We have three hosts from three different podcasts. We are going to talk about financial independence here live at Camp Fi We have Diana Miriam from Optimal Finance Daily. Make some noise. (laughs) Becky Heptig from Catching Up to Fi. And then, of course, me, Jordan Grummet, Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. I was sweating it there. I was afraid you guys wouldn't make any noise. (laughs) So today we're talking about financial independence, but I wanted to twist things around a little bit. Instead of talking about the boons of financial independence, I wanted to talk a moment about the banes. How is financial independence not what you expected to be? I will start the conversation, then I will continue it on with Diana and Becky, and eventually we're going to open the whole conversation up to the actual Camp Fi participants, the people who came here to not only learn about financial independence but build community. They're going to tell us what's on their mind. But first and foremost, you get us podcasters. I was thinking about this question quite a bit today, and I think my biggest realization about financial independence is... I thought that when I had enough money, whatever I decided was enough, because we can argue and debate about what enough money really is, but I always thought that when I had enough money, that all of a sudden money anxiety would disappear. And it didn't. Like, it didn't disappear at all. In fact, after becoming financial in- financially independent, I had to then work through some of those anxieties and start building mechanisms into my life to make that better. Right? I had to talk to myself and say, look, you have enough money. The spreadsheets and the math don't lie, but that didn't solve the problem, and I thought it would. Diana, you're shaking your head. Did you have like the same thing happen to you? Yeah, I think um, when you have a certain level of financial security, it's kind of easy to assume that that would come with like a sense of emotional security, that you would feel safe in a way and um i think when we're diligently like in our spreadsheets and we're doing all this financial planning you know it we can convince ourselves that we're going to have the courage to make a change once we reach a financial goal and then you get there and realize like your bank account can't give you courage that's like inside work that's separate from your financial goals And so I think um, there is a real distinction there. Becky, it's an interesting idea. Diana just said, your bank account can't give you courage. Can it do the opposite? Like, do sometimes people or did you maybe even at some point feel more content and then you hit financial independence and you're like, independence and you're like, oh my God, what happens if I lose it or what happens if it's not enough? For sure. 
And, you know, Stephen and I started so late that we hadn't been spreadsheeting and looking at all this for years, like a lot of people in the Phi community. So when we decided to retire, we had done what we knew to do, but compared to the knowledge I have now, what I knew then is still was still sort of minimal. So we retired, and uh, I was talking to Brad and Jonathan on Choose If I a few years ago, and I told them that when I first started having to withdraw out of my portfolio and pay myself out of that money, that finite bucket of money, because we have no uh, other sources of income. We don't have real estate. We don't have you know side hustles. So when we started paying ourselves out of that bucket, it literally felt like I was stabbing myself in the heart. It was shocking, and it was really, really scary. And I thought, okay, we've, we've looked at this, and we've applied the knowledge we have to these numbers, but, oh, my gosh, we could be wrong. We could just be so wrong and, and have, because we have this um, myopic view of what we're doing, that maybe we're missing something because we just don't know enough. Diana, shock and fear. We think that after we get to financial independence, or even before we get to financial independence, but we have our numbers in order and we see the path, we think that's going to go away. Tell me about some of the things about financial independence that maybe you didn't realize until you were strongly on the path that weren't as good as you thought they would be. Mm. I think what really motivated me in pursuing FI is I wanted full autonomy over my time, right? Like I wanted more time and space in my life to be able to slow down and not like hustle so hard all the time, right? And I felt like I worked really hard towards that. And the negative side of it is sometimes you create so much space in your life, it's like just enough space to fall apart. And you don't realize that a lot of your busyness was like distracting you from other things that you maybe weren't ready to deal with. And so um, I, I think especially anyone with like mental health issues, childhood trauma, a dysregulated nervous system, like those are issues that like money can't necessarily fix. You know, that's like an inside job. And um, having too much space I think can exasperate some of those issues. Yeah, the quote, you know, money solves money problems, yeah, but doesn't really fix everything else. I had the same experience. Like, I kind of fell apart when I found out I was financially independent, partially because I didn't know then what I was supposed to do with myself. I just want to hear from the audience, did financial independence ever at any point make you anxious? Like, just make some noise if it did. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, so, so that's at least a third of the crowd. Does that surprise you, Becky? I don't know. Uh, maybe, but may, I, I, probably not really. Because, like you said, we think that money is going to solve a lot of problems. But then, as Diana mentioned, when you have more time to think and to process what's been going on in your life, suddenly you realize oh, I don't really like this part of it, or I've, there's this issue, but I've been able to ignore it because I have to work 10 hours a day. Mm-hmm. And so I just haven't even been thinking about it. So, yeah, I think it, it, it opens up the opportunity to confront and process some things that maybe we've been ignoring. So tell me, Becky, what form of dysregulation, if you had any, did you start to feel once you got financially independent that you did not foresee? And she's laughing here, and I think it has something to do with maybe one of the audience members. (laughs) (laughs) Could be the one in the blue shirt. Um, So the last five years of Stephen's career, he traveled quite a bit, and he also worked long hours when he was at home. And I was at home caring for my mom. So we both had a lot on our plate And I said many, many times, I cannot wait for you to retire, and we can be together. We can spend time together. And I would hear other wives in my circle of friends talk about, oh, I really don't want him to retire. 
because I don't want him here 24-7. And I was like, I can't imagine that. I just can't fathom. I, I, I want him to be here. So he retired. We moved away from family and friends and everything we knew because we moved closer to, uh, to be closer to our kids and grandkids. And so we started over. And we were home 24-7. And we have a lot of hobbies that we do together, like our car hobby and, and some other things, and, you know, visiting the grandkids. But there are times when I want to go get out of my face. <laughs> <laughs> so we are, in fact, we're still processing with how do we enjoy being together but then not be together so much that we just, I don't want to see him, you know. So there's a, there's a balance there, and we're still working on finding that. Yeah, it's really a point. Most couples aren't used to spending all their time together because one or both of them are working. I mean, we go through our whole careers. We build our lives together. Some of us have kids or pets or all those things we do together but not necessarily always home at the same time. It's surprising, and yet it makes complete sense. This is a little bit of insider baseball, Diana, but I I feel like we, as creators, often point to the most positive effects of the things we're interested in. So when we talk about financial independence, we all speak about it one way or another on our podcasts, And it's easy to talk about all the positive things. Diana, do you think there's, I don't want to use the word dishonesty, but do you think maybe sometimes there's not full disclosure in the people who are creating all this content around financial independence? I just think it's really nuanced, right? Like, and there's a lot of variability. So like, if you ask me, you know, this week, how do you feel? It's one answer. And then like three months ago, it was a different answer. It's easy to say like, you know, this is the way that it is, but there's, it's different every day. You know, like I I think one thing back to the original question, one thing that surprised me is I thought I'd be a lot more self-motivated consistently than I actually am. So I'll go through like months of being like, getting up super early and, you know, doing a morning routine and I'm in like the kind of creative flow and I'm like pumping out, like I'm writing a lot and I'm creating a lot and I'm doing things that I'm really proud of and using my time in ways that are really fulfilling. And then I'll have other periods of time where that just kind of, um, I'm not able to maintain that level of self-motivation. And that surprises me because that's all I've wanted is like that full of autonomy. Um, but our whole lives, our schedule has been dictated by external forces. And it's like, you think you want the keys to that castle, but sometimes I don't feel like we always have the energy to like maintain that consistency over long periods of time. Becky, in a moment, we're going to bring up Camp Five members. They are going to tell us their stories about how financial independence was different for them, or even pursuing it was different for them than they thought it would be. But before we do... Catching up to Phi speaks to a group of people who feel like they started later. Do you think this group comes to the table with their eyes a little bit more wide open? Maybe this is a more experienced group, a group who's been through more things, who maybe their expectations are a little different because they've already felt like they're behind the eight ball. Do you think they think differently about this? Well, you say, you made the comment of eyes wide open. Uh, Some of the people in our audience have their eyes wide open because it's in fear. It's like, oh my gosh, what do I do now? So yes, their eyes may be more wide open, but I think it's very confusing for them because they don't know where to start. They don't know how to, like maybe they've just admitted to themselves of how how differently they've handled money than what they wish they could have and, and wish they could go back. But, um, but I think that, that our age is also an advantage to us. You know, there's, you can point to a whole lot of disadvantages of starting late, but we do have some advantages. And one of those is we've just flat been around the sun more times than most other people. We've got life experiences. We've, we've already handled hard things in our lives 
because I don't know of anybody that's made it to, say, 40, 45, 50 years old that hasn't had something devastating happen to them. And they've, they've dealt with it, they've processed it, and they've walked through the other side. So, yes, they are um, possibly full of some big ball of negative emotions, and they're kind of scared, fearful of what their future is going to look like. But they've got a few tools in their tool belt, and this is something that we really encourage our audience with, is you've got some tools that you may not even be thinking about that are going to help you get this put together and get on the right path and head in the direction you would like to head in. Becky, what you're talking about is wisdom, the wisdom that your audience and hopefully our audience has come to the table with. Now we're going to transition to the wisdom of our own Camp Fi members. What you're going to hear next is a series of Camp Fi attendees coming up to the mic and talking about how financial independence was different than they expected it to be. So let's do this. This is Camp Fi 2023. My name's Parker. Uh, I've been pursuing financial independence since I was in college, freshman year in college. Um, and I, it was different for me because when I got out of college and I had a career in the job that I'm currently in, and I had a stable job and I was saving 75% of my income and I was in a place that I loved, um, I threw it all away in pursuit of the ideal right now instead of the ideal even in as little as five to ten years from then. I threw it all away, but I also like became really intentional about what ideal meant for me on a weekly and a daily basis. And to me, that was the freedom of having my own practice as a chiropractor instead of working for somebody else. And starting that practice with my schedule and my free time accounted for in the way that I want to finish if I were to retire in 10 years. So my path was one that started on this really positive trajectory that seemed to be exactly like we're learning about in the financial independence space, but it completely reversed in a lot of ways to throw away that stability and the security and lean into the stupidity, but also the courage of living the ideal right now and not putting it off for the future. And Right now, I just feel ecstatic about that decision, even though I'm still on the precipice of actually doing something, of actually making money. Like, I'm $240,000 in debt. I have no financial basis to stand on. And I just went for it. And right now, even without that financial basis to stand on, I'm, I'm so confident that I will be successful. And I think it's thanks to my frugality beforehand that gave me the the freedom and the peace of mind to know that I'll be okay no matter what circumstance I'm in. Hi, my name is Abhishek. Um, I've been in, uh, in my financial uh, journey uh, for about last seven, seven, eight years. Um, and, and it has really changed my life in a way where I thought it's all about saving, investing, getting to a point where you don't have to worry about anything. And now that I've been through this journey so far in the last seven years, I'm, I'm really realizing that it's more about, you know, uh, choosing your conscious living, conscious decision making for, about, for your life. And um, that's, been, that's been amazing for me. Like, I'm actually able to think about what I really want to do. And I enjoy the fact that, you know, at that point when I'm five, I don't, I'm not going to have to worry about money, but I'm more excited about what I'm going to get to do. And even right now, now that we are through journey, previously I, I had this scarcity mindset uh, that we talked about today in one of the sessions, but um, really it grew on me that it's not there anymore, and I am more, more and more uh, feeling excited and great about uh, where I am today now and where I'm going um, versus before. So I always thought that it would be like this for 15 years and I'm going to have to always you know, live off of um, $25,000 a year, and now I enjoy spending. Uh, even though I'm in the journey, I have my math worked out for me, and I know when I'm going to retire. And, and the fact that I'm able to do that, it's, it's a very life-changing experience for me. 
I don't think of myself as at my phi number right now, um, but I've had some milestones like uh, paying off a lot of student debt and then feeling this sense of I've passed this thing and it felt really, you know, elation briefly. And then I really thought uh, years ago that when our net worth would get to a million dollars that it would, I would either be phi or it would feel really different. And I just felt like, oh, well, back to work. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then I thought, well, maybe when my uh, investable assets are a million dollars, that'll really be different. And no, it wasn't. Um, and so the, the number that I've thought I would need for a phi number keeps growing, as I do. <laughs> and, uh, and simultaneously, like, on the same trajectory but the opposite direction is my, I've sort of gradually made adjustments in my career and the way I, the way I work with my career where I'm liking it more and doing less of it, so it's a, le- a smaller part of my life. And I'm not as concerned as I was about getting to fly quickly now, and that's been the thing that's been surprising for me, is that um, the concepts are still the same and valuable to me, but uh, reaching it, it, there's less of a defined finish line, which is confusing, of course. (laughs) I thought that once I reached a financial milestone, again, a million dollars, I think it's in our literature. (laughs) Um, You know, I thought, well, then I'll just walk away. But meanwhile, since that was going to take a long time, I thought, well, I might as well make this change to my job and this change to my job. And by the time I got to a million, I didn't hate my job enough to live on that little amount of money. So that surprised me because I, when I got into it, I thought, Um, you know, I'd do anything to leave this job. I'd even live on that amount of money Mm. for the rest of my life with insecurity and everything. And So that was a surprise. And another surprise was that I, I love to connect with people that I've known over my life, and I love to travel on a weekend trip to see someone that I used to know in elementary school or college or, or whenever. And now that financial independence is one of my major hobbies, and I can't stop talking about it, people don't like that. They feel very insecure. They, they feel frustrated that I took a trip to see them, and I'm, like, showing... Like, they think I'm showing off, and I'm just trying to reconnect with an old friend, but it's not as easy to connect with people as I thought it would be because they... They get jealous, I guess. I mean, it's open to all of us. I don't know why they don't just join, but they say, no, no, I can't for these 17 reasons. And then I get frustrated, go back to my fancy points hotel, and go on to the next friend. Hi, my name's Stephanie. Um, I think for myself, I first went for financial independence, just wanting to get out of an office job. And I loved learning and listening to podcasts. But I think sometimes with listening to the podcast, you get ideas for, like, do this tactic, do this tactic. Um, And maybe rather than kind of just, like, analyzing myself or, like, what did I really want from life, I just started adding in all these tactics like house hacking, have an Airbnb, uh, um, things I didn't do but I thought about, like, the food delivery or uh, being a notary. And I I think it just kind of, you know, it's easy to kind of distract and overextend yourself and then you realize you're so tired and you have to like kind of figure out how to get back to yourself. Um, So that would be the one thing is like maybe it's okay to be simple. It's okay to take a little bit longer um, and you don't have to do, it's like fun to learn about all the ideas and maybe try them out, but you don't have to do them all to like try to be the best, uh, most amazing five person that there is out there. Yeah, so I guess my entry into Phi was like 2020, and originally I thought it was going to be more of just 
<laughs> how can I extreme coupon? How can I cut absolutely to the bone, you know, everything that I can to minimize my expenses? And like my wife was trying to change my ideas. It's don't just cut to the bone. You know, you're, you're going to be at 1.80 with so much money. And, <laughs> you know, you can't have as much fun when you're older. And so it started to really change my, my ideas. It's I can go out with my friends and I can go and have a good time. If they want to go bowling, I can say yes. Or, you know, if we want to take a trip, we went out to D.C. recently and I had <laughs> the greatest time of my life with my wife. I mean, she loved everything. We went to the Library of Congress and she loves, you know, books and knowledge. And for me, you know, I've never been there. Felt like a sense of patriotism <laughs> going out to D.C. So just being able to like spend money, you know, without guilt, because I know like my parents had um, like a different idea of money than I do. And for them, it was very like it's a point of contention. And for me, I didn't want to be that way. I wanted it to be an open discussion. I wanted my wife and I to be on the same page. I wanted us to be one unit moving forward towards a goal. My name's Alex, and um, I've been, I guess, working towards my own five journey for about eight years or so. Um, so started out in libraries, reading books on personal finance and evolving to blogs and, you know, reading Reddit posts and uh, watching YouTube videos and, of course, listening to media such as podcasts. And what I ended up finding or, or creating in my mind was the super fi deity, right? The perfect <laughs> fi man, right? Who it's this, this, because, you know, when you're looking at things on the internet, yes, there's these personalities, but in my head, they sort of mash together and do an amalgam of the perfect fi person, right? Who was able to execute the uh, Roth conversion ladder to the, you know, nth degree while also optimizing his life in the current day. And that created a little bit of anxiety, right? Because I like to optimize things and, uh, you know, try and try and push the boundaries as much as I can, right? And so by having this phi deity, you know, that I could not achieve, it, it led to some, some concerns of mine. And so what I found, though, is in coming to in-person events such as this, whether it's, you know, Camp Phi or attending the economy conferences, there's real people here with their real human faults and real human stories. And that grounds me. It brings me to earth, and it helps me realize that, oh, it's not this amalgamated cloud super being. It's a bunch of human beings together. And so that's what's really changed my perspective uh, on my five journey, and I'm very appreciative for it. So we are going to welcome to the table Stephen Boyer. He is the creator of Camp Phi, and I want to talk about what we just heard, Stephen, because you have the unique experience of doing 40 of these campfires, right? So we're talking about a lot of people have come through these doors and in the other locations. In your experience, after talking to all these people, is financial independence what people think it is? Yes, I think it is, actually. I think financial independence is what it is, but I think it's we who change as we're going through the process of it. So I know there's a lot of conversations about, you know, the, the um, comparing like financial independence back in the day when it was super extreme frugality, that type of thing. And then now it's more about having some more present payoff, um, some more, you know, balanced life um, design. Uh, but I think it's just something that I don't think it's the, the financial independence concept that is changing. I think it's that as we are processing through it, we are changing. Diana, it's interesting to me because after hearing the people come up and talk, so there were some negative aspects, right? This wasn't necessarily what people thought it would be. Getting to that million dollar mark didn't just fix everything. But not a single person said, I shouldn't have done this. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like I think about, I don't regret getting better with money or like creating options for myself or uh, quitting my job. You know, I don't regret any of that. But I think like we make decisions or we 
like create goals out of like the expectation of how we think that'll make us feel. Um, and sometimes it doesn't work out as, you know, it doesn't maybe meet our full expectations, but it doesn't mean that we wouldn't like, we would have, you know, not pursued it at all. Mm -hmm. Stephen, are we seeing or are you seeing expectations change over the few days as new people come to these campfires? They come in. Do you see that people leave thinking differently than they walked in the door? Uh, I don't have a lot of feedback, really, for that. But I do think that, um, I mean, people have mentioned, like, the power of just being connected to other people in real life. So I think that can make a difference from the beginning of the, the weekend to the end, especially if... Uh, in their normal everyday life, they have not been able to connect with anyone um, of like mind. So um, that's why Camp Fi exists. So I would, I would hope that, you know, at the end of the camp, they're a little bit different than at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Becky, do you remember the first time you ever met someone who understood what financial independence was? Because, you know, you get in your own headspace of listening to podcasts and reading blogs and reading mm-hmm. books. Mm-hmm but you never actually meet or talk to anyone who's done it until you do, right? You either go to a local meetup or you come to something like this. What was it like for you the first time you talked to someone who actually got it? The, probably the first time that we were surrounded by a group of people in financial independence in the, in the financial independence space was our first camp by, which was camp by Rocky mountain 2019. It was a group of people just like this. And on Friday night, we all go through and introduce ourselves, right? We weren't playing the name game then, <laughs> but, we, but we still went through and introduced ourselves. And I thought, oh my gosh, there, at the variety of the things that people were interested in, their hobbies, their passions, and I was just amazed at you know, oh, th- this person over here mentioned that. I want to go talk to them about that because either I'm interested in that or I like that too. And, I mean, for example, um, Stephen and I connected with Mark and, and uh, Marge, his wife, because we both mentioned cars. And I was like, you mean there's somebody in here that drives race cars <laughs> like we do? And I thought, who would have thought so the connections with the people were so meaningful to us. And then at that point, we were, now we were retired, but we were still learning. So I was so thankful that there were folks there that I could talk to about these topics who could help me understand them. And like one of the folks said earlier, you, after you start understanding and implementing five principles, Sometimes you feel like you're on an island because your friends or your family, you know, either look at you like you've got three heads or they, they're like, I don't want to hear it. You know, I don't, I don't understand it. I don't think that that's possible or whatever their opinion about it is. So sometimes you feel kind of alone in these things that internally you're really excited about and then you have no outlet to talk to anyone about. So I just love that part of the community. We are joined by Camp Fi attendee Mark Troutman, who a lot of us know from the financial independence world. Mark, one of the reasons I asked this question about the things about financial independence that maybe were off-putting or different or not what you expected is really to get to this idea of burnout. Like, is there such a thing as financial independence burnout? Yeah, I wouldn't say there's... Well, at least I have not experienced it yet, and I hope there isn't financial independence burnout. But I would say a couple things in that from the financial perspective, getting to financial independence, which I am and have been for a while, um, is the drawdown phase is very difficult or at least mentally difficult. I also retired from something, not to something. So I would suggest that anyone that is considering retiring fully from employment, think about what you're retiring to. So it took me a a little while to figure that out. So that's still a work in process for me. Um, And then there will be things that uh, throw you for a loop. So as many people may know, my wife passed away from cancer about, what, uh, three, four years into retirement. So that was a big unexpected, you know, situation for sure. 
and this community has been so helpful in that respect. Um, but um, I would say, you know, I like the idea that the financial independence community is kind of evolving from this very aggressive, like, we're going to save, 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 we're going to get to this point, and everything's going to be, you know, unicorns and rainbows, quoting, you know, Carl Jensen. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. But um, I think that I'm really impressed with the community's involvement to living a life of balance, the concepts of things like Coast Fi. Um, and uh, we, when we're talking about fulcrums today and leverage uh, in a different realm and the fastest man on the earth. So you'll have to look for the, uh, the YouTube video of that once Stephen puts that up. Um, but thinking about a life of balance, right? And I like that aspect of it. But as far as burnout, I don't know. I haven't experienced it yet, and uh, we'll see. But I think there is definitely an evolution to everyone who goes through this journey, and it's just a matter of how you manage that evolution. So we're talking about burnout. We've been talking about the banes of financial independence, if any exist. Well, the other side of that is the boon. And so certainly for me, the boon of financial independence, the thing that I didn't expect out of it, especially in the beginning, was the community and support, right? So I didn't realize that there's this group of people who I'd become connected to, which would eventually form the bulwark, the bulwark of my support system. Diana, we've been talking about the banes. Let's talk about the boons. Anything unexpected about financial independence that was just a nice surprise? One of the things I like to tell myself is that I can't anticipate today the opportunities that will present themselves tomorrow. And I think when you have financial stability or financial independence um, and time and space, like talked about, you know, the potential negative side of having too much time and space in your life. But I think the positive side of that is that you have the resources, whether it's time, money, or potentially energy, um, to seize opportunities that present themselves that you couldn't anticipate at the time when you were coming up with your perfect plan. Um, one example I have is like I had never had my sights on like home ownership, um, but when I bought I bought my house in 2018. And it wasn't something I had set out to do. It was like an opportunity that presented itself. And I had the resources to seize that opportunity. Um, and so kind of what Becky said about flexibility, I think it living this lifestyle almost allows you to be a little bit more nimble and um, for when those opportunities present themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Jillian Johnsrud talks a lot about mini retirements. And I think that's a way that we can build in some of that flexibility. And, and, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you could take a mini retirement just to have a little bit of downtime to recharge or to go take a vacation or to work on projects around the house. But it, if you have stability in your financial life, then it just gives you so many opportunities to, to try something that you might not otherwise be able to do. Becky, anything on your mind that you're like, wow, I didn't expect that, and it's kind of really added to my life? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we've learned in being financially independent and being retired is that you need to be flexible. You enter retirement with a plan. I wouldn't suggest that anyone enter retirement without a plan. But then you also have to know that it's going to change. Just like everything in your life up to that point hasn't gone exactly the way you think. So I love the independence that it's given us. We've actually recently figured out a way to pull some of our assets forward without feeling like we're jeopardizing our older self so that we can enjoy some of the money now while we are in what we call the go-go years, while we're capable and, and want to do things. And we, we had that planned out that we would be doing X, a, little, a lot of X and a little bit of Y. And it turns out that it's turned around the other way because of the connections and the friends that we've made. So we thought we would be doing some travel and a lot of cars. And now we're doing a little bit of cars and a whole lot of travel because we're traveling with friends. And there, to me, there just isn't anything better. 
Mark Troutman, do you need to be financially independent to embrace the financial independence mindset? No, I don't think so. I think that once you start to, and we had some conversations today about that, just, you know, as we were walking around and just in our free time, that I think as you build a financial backstop, you get a lot of the benefits of financial independence in that you can be individually minded, you can decide um, that maybe you don't want to do that thing that your company is asking you to do. They may say, oh, you need to cancel that vacation and stay in work. And you can say, yeah, I'm not going to do that. And I've pulled that trigger quite a bit. And it's kind of like the J.L. Collins FU card kind of concept. Um, and I found that once you get the financial wherewithal behind you just to be able to make those decisions, it's almost like being financially independent without never having to work again. So yes, I think there are a lot of benefits on the road to financial independence, almost as much as the benefits that you get once you get there. Becky, do you wish you found all this earlier? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, people talk about um, the concept of uh, if you're a married couple of live on one salary and bank the rest. I'm like, where was that <laughs> when I was 20? But, you know, you also have to know yourself. And I know myself well enough to know that if I had been presented with these ideas earlier, I'm not sure I would have listened. I just was in a place where I couldn't <coughs> look down the road that far, that what I needed to be setting my older self up for was too far down the road for me to even conceptualize it. So in a minute, I'm going to ask Diana and Becky about their final thoughts about this conversation today. But what I take from this conversation is this idea that Financial independence, just like almost everything else in life, won't be exactly what you think it is, right? There's going to be some unexpected banes, things that you are less pleasant or, or didn't think were going to happen that do. And then there's also these unexpected boons, ways of living that you never imagined could be. But ultimately, what I get out of this is... The community will serve you in both cases, and maybe that's really the unexpected benefit of doing all this, is it binds you to like-minded individuals who end up being the bulwark of your support. And, and maybe, maybe that's the real secret that, that we don't often talk about. Becky, takeaways mm -hmm. from this conversation, anything you pull from it? I think that, like I said earlier, that you need to be flexible and have some expectations, but the world's not ending if things don't turn out the way you want. Because even before, like in our case, we lived a lot of married life before Phi, and our life was already like that. You know, things don't turn out the way you want. But when you have a community, then you've got someone to lean on. There is a subset group that... Um, that Stephen and I and several people here at camp are a part of. And we were talking, we, we came early, spent two or three days here in Minnesota uh, before we came to camp, and we were talking about how much we feel like family. And I said, you guys are the, I can call you at two in the morning if I need to, even though you don't live down the street from me. And they have already helped Stephen and I walk through a, a personal tragedy that we've had in our lives. So the community means so much more than learning about money. Diana, final thoughts? I think we all kind of evolve in our relationship with money. Like I think a lot of us resonate with that starting point where the question is like, how do I increase my income and reduce my expenses and invest the difference? And what's my fine number? And how do I get there faster? Like those are the questions that consume us when we first get into this and then I think it kind of evolves into some harder questions like how do I want to spend my time what do I want to create who do I want to spend it with um, and those questions are harder to answer um, but they're worthwhile and so while you know it may not feel warm and fuzzy all the time I think it's a really worthwhile endeavor so yeah I think that that's really what I got out of it 
This has been a special presentation of the Earn and Invest podcast, Catching Up to Fi and Optimal Finance Daily. Camp Fi Midwest 2023, say goodbye. That's a wrap. So now we are going to keep the recorder rolling. This is the after show talking about things we didn't expect to happen after financial independence. I've invited Chris up to tell us about something he might not have expected spending a little money on, but has become something he now tells people about at Camp Fies. Chris, has there been a special purchase in your life? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I've always been uh, a feline lover, a cat lover, and so one thing that um, one thing I was able to do was uh, was get an F1 Savannah, which is uh, it depends on where you live. Some some states still classify it as a wild cat. Okay, because I thought that was a race car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I thought you yeah, were buying a no, race car, so F, which is quite expensive. F one, so there's there's this this basically this feral scale, um, how wild this cat is. So this is an F one is one, so like uh, one offspring away from wild. So its father was a wild African serval, his mother was a domestic short hair. So in some states, they're... Kind of like Chris here. That's right, kind of like me. But yeah, but again, it's one of those things where I never would have, I never would have spent the money on... Because they're, they're very hard to breed. And uh, often, often the, the, the fathers are sterile. So it's hard to breed. So they are somewhat expensive. But again, one of those things where I never would have been able to buy one um, without, again, this journey that I was on starting back, I think... God, it's almost been ten years since I discovered Phi and all you people. So, and and these these F one savannas are not legal in every state. They are not. Yeah, <laughs> you can't, they are legal in your state. They are. Yes, uh, <laughs> in in my home state of Minnesota, you can have uh, savanna, and uh, but yeah, he is uh, a bundle of energy. Um, uh, only eats raw protein. So, <laughs> so explain exactly what that means. Yeah. So basically, uh, raw. Chicken, pork, beef, you name it. Um, he loves it. And uh, while they're growing uh, up until, you know, uh, one year old, I mean, basically they can eat up to 30% of their body weight every day. So you can, you, you can feed them. You can go through a lot of meat. But, uh, yeah, when I, first, <laughs> when, I, when I first got him, you know, I was, uh, I'd process, I'd get whole chickens, and I would process the chicken, and I would, like, Meal prep for my cat, and, uh, <laughs> but then I, I realized I'm spending like I'm spending like 45 mm-hmm. minutes carving up chicken for my. I don't do this for myself, right? Yeah. Um, I think you and Brad Barrett maybe should have a <laughs> yeah. conversation about food prep and, but, and uh, buying chicken and both. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But no, it's uh, it, he, it's a fun time. I actually, I just sent a text to my daughter reminding her, "Hey, you better go feed Malachi because mm. you know he's gonna, gonna be hungry." <laughs> wow, you might so, lose a limb. That's right. <laughs> So you said you you used to meal prep. So well, I, I still do. I just don't spend as much time. Like I'll do like pork loins now, where it's just a lot easier just to cut up the you know, carving up chicken is a lot of work. <laughs> wow. wow. Okay. And any other unexpected purchases? Anyone buy something once they're on the path to financial independence or financially independent that they never thought they would? My parents built a house in the Colorado Rockies, and it's a beautiful place, but it was on only two acres. And after I reached my one million magical mark and decided not to quit my job, I reached out to my neighbors and bought uh, six acres of their land for $300,000, which now I have to keep working to pay off that. (laughs) But I already had decided to keep working, so hopefully... What are you going to do with the six acres? Forest bathe. Forest bathe. What does that mean? Be in the forest. Does it, does it involve clothes or no clothes? It's bathing. <laughs> <laughs> I need to understand this. Hiking boots. Okay. And, yeah, no, fully clothed. Okay, all right. I'm just going to ask. Because you could get sunburned. It's just wilderness, um, wilderness land. So because the cabin is a rural space for me, it was a really big part of 
why I wanted to retire is to be at this cabin in a forest. And then I realized, well, I only have two acres. This could totally not be a forest. I'm depending on other people for it to remain a forest. So it was a huge purchase. Is the land forested already? Yes. So you won't have to create that. Right. Okay. It's It's been totally unmanaged for my whole life. I've I've lived next to this forest, and so it's got huge timber that's down. In fact, this year I spent $30,000 um, just getting a little bit of the forestry done. Anyone else? Last chance? Talk about a purchase? Talk about anything before we close this up. Uh, my... Uh less than frugal purchases were uh, a used RV and just this week a $5,000 bike which was it yeah. u- was it used to no uh, cuz with the RV at least you can say it was used so that's, yeah. then it's yeah fine. that's my defense then it's fine. Yeah. yeah 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 i never would have thought i would ever spend that much money on the what bike what kind of bike it's a, a carbon fiber uh racing gravel bike and i love riding it so far yeah yeah so you would say that the purchase, even though large, has value for you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have, I have no mixed feelings about it. It just feels weird compared to, like, the, you know, 2019 version of me would be shocked and shouting. Mortified. and Yeah. 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 Really upset. Yeah. And I'm not the same person. Yeah. All right. We're good. Recording's going off. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Catching Up to Five. We would appreciate it if you could leave a five-star review so that our message can reach others. We are not lawyers, financial advisors, accountants, or tax experts. Please consult your own professional advisors before making any important decisions. Our content is for entertainment and education purposes only. We'll see you next time on Catching Up to Five.